So hello everyone and thank you for joining Boone, Trish and I to talk about some of the key issues and principles of syncope and some of the things that we talk about in clinic um, and that we talk about in our post-clinic meeting when we're discussing um, issues. So the first question, very basic, if I can ask you Boone, what's the difference between a blackout, a faint and syncope? So I'll introduce another uh, term, which is loss of consciousness uh, into, that, uh, into that definition, because um, a, a loss of consciousness is when uh, the, the, the brain doesn't receive enough oxygen or the brain uh, shuts down for any other reason, causing uh, a person to uh, lose consciousness, which means there's no brain activity that's meaningful to maintain consciousness. <laughs> Now, so that's a loss of consciousness. And clearly there are very many causes of loss of consciousness. So for example, a concussion or head injury can transcendently disturb your consciousness centers. And that could be a cause of loss of consciousness as can too much alcohol intake, as can epilepsy uh, cause loss of consciousness. But syncope is a very specific uh, reason for loss of consciousness. And a syncope event is when there isn't enough blood flow or oxygen supplied to the brain. And so the brain shuts down its consciousness function because of that lack of oxygen or blood. And in terms of the causes of syncope, the one thing we need to remember uh, when we're looking at patients, or if you're a patient, the one thing you need to know is that syncope in the form of vasovagal syncope is the most common reason for somebody to lose consciousness. Now, it, it, it probably affects uh, one in two patients in their lifetime. So uh, it's not surprising if you've ever had an episode of loss of consciousness due to vasovagal syncope. But there is a more important reason of loss of consciousness that can be quite serious, and that's called cardiac syncope. And that's when you have a heart rhythm abnormality for example, a very rapid heart rate or a very slow heart rate that leads to impaired blood flow to the brain. And that can also be a reason for loss of consciousness. Now that's not vasovagal syncope. In fact, that's a medical emergency. And you must never forget that if you have lost consciousness in a very abrupt way, for example, falling and having a significant injury without any preceding warning symptoms, that, that is something you need to uh, bear in mind. Now, a transient loss of consciousness or TLOC, which is a medical phrase, which is a bit confusing as well, purely refers to an episode of loss of consciousness that is transient and it's normally ascribed to vasovagal syncope. Coming back to your question, what is a blackout and what is a faint? A blackout generally is synonymous with a transient loss of consciousness, most typically to do with vasovagal syncope. And a faint is again synonymous with vasovagal syncope. So I hope that clarifies it. That's very clear. Thank you. Only one question though. A lot of people say that when they have vasovagal syncope, they, they do note that their heart rate goes very slow. Um, so is that this, could you ever call that cardiac syncope or is that a separate entity? So that's a very specific form of vasovagal syncope, which is called cardio inhibitory syncope. And that occurs when there is a reflex, which is mediated by the vagus nerve, which is the main nerve, which controls the rest and digest system or the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, the key difference between that and, for example, somebody with a very strong bradycardia from a conducting tissue disorder, for example, heart block, which is a medical emergency, is that in vasovagal syncope, even with heart inhibition, you tend to get the warning symptoms in the 30 seconds or a minute prior to passing out. So you might feel warm flushing sensation, you might feel dizzy, nauseous. Whereas in the form of cardiac syncope, which is related to a transient slowing or an abrupt slowing of heart rate due to complete heart block, for example, this usually leads to a very abrupt loss of consciousness like that. So you'd be standing up or lying down or speaking while seated 
and suddenly you face plant on the floor or suddenly you fall with an injury. And that is always uh, from a, hist uh, a history taking perspective, uh, a very red, uh, very much a red flag for a bradycardia induced cardiac syncope as opposed to the cardio inhibitory vasovagal syncope that you talked about. Thank you. So Trish, it seems that these warning symptoms are quite relevant then when we're asking our patients about, uh, about their syncopal episode. Just remind me, what are those warning symptoms um, that, that, that would point you towards vasovagal syncope? Well, that's, good. that's a good question because I'm often told when I ask patients this question, they'll say, it just happened, nurse. Had no warning, didn't see it come in, came from nowhere. And so it's hard to recognize, especially if it's you've never had this before, and it's the first time it's happened to you, what might be a warning sign? So if there's a broad collection of things, it doesn't mean to say you'll get them all, or you'll experience them all, or they'll all come in that order. But um, feeling, uh, as Boone just said, warm, or people talk about, a, they'll sort of do this, either be a flush came up here, or something happened that way, but there's a sensation of rush or, or a feeling that could be a warmth or heat, um, or suddenly become very hot, very sweaty. Um, sometimes feeling a little dizzy or lightheaded, not the room spinning around, but just feeling a little bit off balance, um, feeling weak, feeling wobbly in the legs, feeling you just need to sit down, feeling a bit drained. Um, you might feel something in your tummy, in your stomach, you might feel a little bit sick, or you might feel you need the bathroom. Um, you can feel something in your chest. It might be a tightness or it might be a sensation that you need to breathe a little faster or you need to take some. People often go and open windows or want to go outside. They think they need to breathe deeply and they can't quite get the breath in that they want. Um, you may feel your heart racing. You may not. Um, and then your vision can get a little funny. So you might have anything from sparkling lights, spots, pixelated vision, a bit blurred, black spots. And then typically I find for my patients, the last thing to go is your hearing maybe. So you might feel as if you're underwater or somebody's just muffled your ears or sometimes a ringing. Now I've never experienced it, but patients do say they get this ringing in their ears um, before they lose consciousness. And tell me, Trish and Boone, have either of you ever had vasovagal syncope? That's a great um, question. I've, I've had a vasovagal presyncope, which is uh, the condition in which Trish is describing before you pass out uh, or have syncope, uh, you are bound to have a reaction to prevent you passing out. And I've been close to um, passing out. And I remember one particular situation where I was playing tennis on a, a very hot day. I think it was 31 degrees. And uh, I had just come to the net to pick up the balls and I just squatted down. And when I stood up again, I really felt um, that I was going to pass out. And so the first thing to say is that I saw dark spots like uh, my tennis balls coming into my vision, many of them, and my hearing became a bit muffled. So I needed to sit down and actually uh, more than that, I needed to lie down and get my son to um, lift my legs. And after about two minutes, I felt better, but not better enough to continue the game. So I, I drank a bucket loads of water and then I sat for a while and then, and then we stopped playing. And this is only after 35 minutes of playing. And I guess the thing to say here is that even if you haven't been prone to uh, having vasovagal syncope, it can hit you when the constellation of situations around you match up in a way. It's like all your ducks lining up in a row to give you the perfect conditions to try and make you faint. And on, this, and on this occasion, I was a bit dehydrated before I went for the game. It was the hottest day in the summer that year. And I had been playing and sweating for 35 minutes uh, and I was very dehydrated. Mel, can I, can I just, um, I was, when I was listening to Boone, there was a, the question about loss of consciousness and I've just wondered if we should clarify what we mean by that, because very often you'll have doctors and nurses ask you, did you have a full loss of consciousness? Um, or did you have a near syncope? Or did you have a pre-syncope? And that can be confusing what we mean by that. 
what we mean by a full loss of consciousness and by consciousness we mean that you you basically are not aware you're not conscious at that time so you won't see anything you won't hear anything you won't be aware of what's happened during that time that's what we mean by a full loss of consciousness so if you can say well um and this is quite common that i couldn't see anything but i could hear people talking to me um but i couldn't respond uh, that might be a partial, but it's not a full loss of consciousness. Or if you can say, well, I could hear and I could see, um, but I, uh, that wouldn't, that we wouldn't call that a loss of consciousness. So don't be surprised when sometimes patients say, well, I don't know what happened. That's what we mean by a loss of consciousness. Mm -hmm. You're not expected to hear and, and see and be able to respond to people um, when you're unconscious. So just to clarify what we mean by, by a conscious loss of consciousness but yeah. sometimes people get close to that but they don't fully uh lose awareness of that of that time and, that's and it's yeah typically and it's the other thing about uh when we talk about basal vagal syncope is the length of time that people are, are unconscious for it's typically a brief seconds maybe a couple of minutes do you think boone but well, i mean that's a crucial point if you have basal vagal syncope it's one of the subsets of a transient loss of consciousness now if you lose consciousness and you wake up on itu two days later that's not vasovagal syncope so people with vasovagal syncope don't have this uh, history of uh, waking up on itu that's as far as i'm concerned cardiac syncope yeah and i think another interesting point to make is that i often work with older people um, and we know that often when older people have a syncopal episode, they may not be able to recall the details exactly. And so often a third of people of older people who've had a syncopal episode might say that they, they didn't. Um, so that they're not aware that they've even had a blackout. Um, uh, and so often, you know, when people come in with unexplained falls or unexplained attacks or drop attacks, that might be a clue that, that something has happened. So not all people are aware, but with vasovagal syncope, it sounds like you often are aware. Um, and it sounds like, I mean, I've had a couple of episodes of vasovagal syncope in my life, and I felt very ill with it. And as you said, Boone, after your episode on the tennis court, you couldn't go on and play tennis, um, and you had to rest for the rest of the day. So it's quite a, it's quite a draining episode. And why is that? That's a great uh, question. And I, I, I think uh, the, the episode of vasovagal syncope and, and here is speculation. I'm, I'm not sure I'm aware of any data that explains exactly the question, the answer to the question that you're asking, but my speculation is as follows. And this comes from the experience shared with, with Trish as well in seeing our tilt table, uh, tilt table test patients recover very rapidly sometimes. And sometimes they're wiped out as they email you uh, the day or two after to say, what did you do to me? So my, my impression is this, that there is, a really strong element of vasovagal pre-syncope that precedes vasovagal syncope. That is, before you actually lose consciousness, you kick in into a super fright or flight uh, response mode. And that surge of adrenaline is akin to, and here is where I'm uh, trying to give an analogy without any scientific proof, but imagine a super hard workout, like you, you've never done a, a 10K run in your life. The, 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 the most you've done is 1K, let, let's say. And suddenly somebody forces you to run 10, 10 kilometers. And at the end of that run, you've exhausted all your, if you like, nervous tension, your fright or flight response. And so you're going to need a longer period to recover from that 10K run. Now, suppose you are a marathon runner and you're very used to doing 10K runs every second day. That, that 10K response that, that we force you to do will not cause you to feel unwell afterwards. If you're very unfit and you're not used to it and you do that 10K run, you will be flawed for 24 to 48 hours afterwards. Now, bring that to the cath lab in understanding how our patients or some patients with vasovagal syncope feels the preceding surge in the five to 10 minutes before somebody faints is quite important to unpick. And maybe at a separate session, we'll talk more specifically about this. But when you have such a high sympathetic surge, which means your fright or flight response kicks in to give you more nervous tension to improve your blood pressure, 
by secreting lots of adrenaline and cortisol, which then um, makes your heart beat stronger and faster to maintain a high blood pressure. That maintenance of high blood pressure for the preceding 10 minutes before you pass out is equivalent to your 10K run in an unconditioned person. And therefore, when you recover from that, you are not going to feel normal for some time. And that's my kind of best guess explanation from the experience that we have. Would you agree, Trish? Uh, I think I think that's certainly a, from a physiological point of view. That's that's a certainly an, uh, one element. There may be other issues as well. How different people respond and and react, um, especially in and then tilt test conditions. I think um, that's very interesting. So maybe so Trish, do you have to to warn people? And I'll I'll ask you in a moment what is a tilt table test. But when they come. Um, that often they may feel unwell for a couple of days after the episode. I've noticed a lot of uh, people I speak to say that they, they feel wiped out for the rest of the day and they have to sleep. Um, so that's that's interesting. Can you tell us what is a tilt table test? Um, well, I think they're getting quite a bad rap for the tilt table test. So a tilt table test is not what it sounds like, but you think you're going to be put on some sort of instrument of torture and then split back and forth. Most of my patients think they're going to be hung upside down or flip back and forth until they pass out, which is not a, not a comforting thought. And I'm surprised I, anybody would come in that case. But it's a way of us um, looking at what I call your anti-gravity shield, which is the autonomic system that maintains the, the blood going from your feet back up to your head and staying there. Um, and it's a way of us doing it in a controlled way where we can look at your blood pressure and look at your heart rate and look at your breathing and also find out how you experience that uh, process of going from lying to almost standing um, and then standing for 20 minutes, possibly. Um, and then a further challenge after that. But it's a way of us challenging that anti-gravity shield to see how your body responds to, um, to being upright, basically, and maintaining that, that process. We don't, in, we, it's, not an in, uh, it's, it's not a very active uh, or very, um, what's the word, rigorous test in that it, it's more prolonged standing. Um, but it is a challenge. We ask you not to eat or drink beforehand. You've come to a hospital. There are a number of things which can make sometimes that, that a particular challenge for some patients. And, and, what and I, sorry. Uh, so I was just gonna add the, the difference between a tilt and an active stand test, because uh, uh, Trish mentioned the word standing, is that on a tilt table test, um, you're, you're, you're on a table that is horizontal and the, the, the and the table importantly has a foot plate down here. So if your legs are down here, your head is here. When you're tilted upright, your legs are actually resting on a foot plate and there is a strap which is very loosely held around your legs and not much space in which you can shuffle your legs. And one of the key components of a tilt is to deactivate your uh, fidgeting response in your lower limbs because that is going to be the difference between tilting an active stand. In an active stand, which means you just stand up, your legs tend to, tend to move subtly and with the calf and quadricep contractions, you might be able to maintain, uh, because the calves and the quadriceps are, are the second pump, you might be able to maintain some more blood pressure. Whereas on the tilt, you immobilize these lower limb muscles and therefore you have a greater likelihood of pooling blood in your lower limbs, which is the, is the concept of an anti-gravity shield that, that Trish talks about. Because one of the key components of that anti-gravity shield is working your lower limb muscles. And on the tilt table test, as much as we can try, we tell the patients not to fidget, not to move the legs. Therefore we immobilize the legs and we enhance the pooling into the lower limbs to try and elicit that basal vagal response.